lads and ladies, welcome back finally to a never manga review. Finally, it's been a week too long, and uh, we are getting back into the whole Kaiju Girl Caramelize series, and we are doing Volume Four. Now, with Volume Four, it's a little four, four, four. Uh, with Volume Four, sorry, English is a little bit lacking today. Uh, with this version, it's mostly talking about um, small instances with. Um, Kuro's relationship with um, Minami. Is it Minami? I can't. See, I'm so sorry because I always, uh, yeah, Minami. Because I always forget his name for some stupid reason, which is kind of ironic because he's like one of the most popular people in this book at the moment. Like literally and figuratively in the story because um, after the whole instance of Horogon like leaning into smooching, basically, everyone like sees him as this like kaiju hot frog hot frog or something like that I, I don't know why i mean like it's it's the same thing with like if an elephant like comes up to you and like donks you on the head basically people want to ask like oh why would the elephant so interested in you all of a sudden you know people want to know people like get really interested in stuff like that so he decides to um well he doesn't decide to he basically is forced into it by a producer to go on a daytime show and talk about it basically he was he thought he was just going to go talk about it on the news like quietly talk about it but no it's one of those over the top daytime tv shows that like really drag out the truth and don't really uh give like an honest um interpretation of someone's story basically it's just there for clout basically which he is not there to he's trying to protect horagon and uh in a sense koro from uh the public basically and he's also protecting Koro because he doesn't want the public eye anywhere nearer because I feel like he has an idea of what it's like to be popular I mean of course he's popular so he knows what it's like to have like everyone's attention and it like you, you have no time for yourself basically and he tells her this much and she agrees to a certain extent but of course she can't help but being jealous especially by this one actress who kind of like tells him like you know like I've always wanted to be like this producer's um actress like I wanted her as my agent and um she kind of feels like he's robbed her of that or to that he apologizes to her and um he then ends up telling uh Cora like uh, the little injury he had on his head one of the little bruises from her hat that bumped into him which makes no sense I mean unless the hat is like cool Lao's hat like made out of steel or something because like I can't see like a hat causing like a bruise to someone's head but uh, yeah it's interesting really I anyway she starts to build up this um what do you call it like this type of uh I want to say supersonic breath because it, it, it kind of like comes out in a burst where like it's stuck in her throat and she has to like turn around to the window and open the window and then like burst it out into the river and to her dismay, she doesn't notice that someone notices it, basically. And I'll come to that later on at the end of the book, because it's kind of a huge plot twist, basically. Well, not really a plot twist, it's just a, a continuation of the story. It adds some interesting things to it. Anyway, um, Kuro's friend, I can't remember her name, I'm so sorry. Uh, she's the um, Horogon fanatic, basically. She just wants to tell Horogon how much she loves him and all this crap. I'm thinking to myself, this is... a very strange story but you know we'll carry on with it because it's comedic value and stuff like that anyway um it kind of leads to a nice touching moment where she's unfortunately broken her leg after Cora was trying to like stop her from going over the edge of the cliff and so they're sat there with each other because she can't move and um, she's basically trying to explain to her like um what Horrigan means to her in a certain sense like how uh, it kind of gave her like purpose in a certain sense which I can understand I mean it's like having a passion and um you know that passion kind of leads to your life being somewhat complete because it's you know it's something you enjoy doing and it's something that um is an extension of your character basically and her extension of her personality is mostly her love for horagon basically she's a lover of kaijus basically as we all are we anyone watching this basically anyone reading this we all are fans of kaiju basically and we all enjoy a good little monster bash basically so it's just i've always found that interesting how we look at monsters like giant monsters fighting for destroying a city and it just 
meshes with us. I don't know what it is. It's just the idea of two monsters just standing and banging it out with one another. It just sounds like a great afternoon, you know. It just sounds fantastic, really. Uh, anyway, uh, they're then attacked by some giant-ass Komodo dragons. They're on the island, which is meant to be a representation or a reference of Monster Island. So, a nice little nod there. Uh, before all this, she kind of gets Cora to like dress up as one of the um, Mothra twins, basically, and starts singing the Horogon song to try and get him out. And she even promises, like, you know, if he can't come out, then I'll drop my act for him, basically, my love for him, basically. I won't, I'll stop chasing him. We all know that's not going to happen because, unfortunately, Cora has to turn into Horogon to save her from being eaten by Komodo dragons. And there's this funny ass scene where she turns into Horrigan and then the faces on the Komodo dragon just make me die. It's this one. It's it's this one, but the faces, they're just like looking up like, what the hell? Like really, like it looks really cartoony and like really comical. It's just hysterical. Also, there's this picture of an egg, which I will explain later on that has some very unique plot points to it but anyway yes continuing on Minami basically uh, comes into contact with Koro after quite a long while because they haven't seen each other in quite a while and um, Koro kind of like reprimands him in a certain sense for like trying to protect Horogon because technically he doesn't know anything about Horogon, or in a certain sense her, which she mistakenly says, like, you don't know anything about me. And then he's like, about you. And then she has to, like, double back, basically. But it's fine, because he's kind of distracted with Jumbo King. I think it's Jumbo King? That's the name of the corgi? Yeah, because he loves dogs, basically. And um, there was, like, this little uh, moment where, he, where Koro thought Minami was basically saying to her, like, oh, we love to cuddle. And then... Cora's kind of like, oh god, oh god, what? We haven't even like done anything yet, and he just wants to cuddle me or something like that. She then apologizes on behalf of Japan for what's about to happen because she then thinks that you know this is going to get too intense and she's just going to turn into Horrigan and destroy the city, as you do basically. But no, he just wants to hug Jumbo King. He just wants to hug the dog basically. Into that, she's kind of dejected but also uh, like relieved at the same time. You know, you ever had that like? You know, you've eaten a muffin and you feel like, oh, I'm full. But then I, like, regret it because, like, you know, I, I, I'm going to have dinner later on. Or something like that. I don't know. It's, it, I guess it's just, a, it's, I guess it depends on the person, basically. But it's something similar to that. You know, you're happy, but you're kind of, like, depressed at the same time, basically. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Then there's this section where, um, I'm trying to remember. I've just read the book as well. and My memory is bad. Yes. She's walking around uh, the town. She's basically um, heading off to school, I believe. And then she's stopped by this very huge, very handsome looking muscular bloke who looks very similar to her uncle, to Kuro's uncle for some strange reason. I feel like they might be related in some way, shape or form. I'm not so sure. But um, he basically tells her that he saw what she did the other night. She, He saw her like the breath go into the river because of all the emotion was building up in her throat and she just had to let it out into the river and to that she kind of like is dumbfounded at the same time but she tries to leave he stops her she kind of like s s screams for help and then um he then tries to tell her like you know please hear me out or otherwise i'll, I'll tell people you know like if, as long as you hear me out i won't tell people she smacks him in the face with her tail, and then he's dumbfounded. He's like, oh my god, it's a tail. I was right. And then she just runs away. And then it cuts to this section where um, we go and see uh, Cora's mum, who is climbing a mountain somewhere on uh, Monster Island. And then she meets her... Cora's uncle, basically. I don't know if it's actually her uncle, or it might just be a family friend. I think it's a family friend, most likely. Uh, they talk about how old times were, you know, how they're not young anymore. How 17 years ago, they were young, up-and-coming um, 
paleontologists. I, I want to say they're paleontologists, but I guess they're not paleontologists. I mean, and paleontology is mostly about um, collecting fossils and um, flora and fauna, whilst um, the other one is about finding arch 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 artifacts, basically, of um, different parts of history, basically. So I guess in a certain sense you could count this as pain as them being paleontologists in a certain sense. Anyway, uh, he basically alludes to the fact that um, she took an egg from the island. And also there was a small little thing that I kind of went over. On that same island where Kuro was with her friend, she saw a cave painting of Horogon, basically. So it's a possibility that the egg that um, the mother of Kuro stole is more than likely Koro. And that's where the picture of the shattered egg comes into play because the mother more than likely has that egg on display because Boro, Boro? Because Koro was more than likely born from it, basically. The interesting thing about that is that we don't really get much information on it. We're kind of like barraged at the end of this book. We're kind of like introduced to a new character that surprisingly knows who she is. And then we're just bombarded with the fact that she was from an egg, that she was actually a child from another kaiju, basically. From this Haragon, basically. Because that's the thing we always wanted to know about Godzilla, was how he was able to um, continue on throughout the years, basically, from uh, the Heisei era and uh, the uh, era before that, all the way up to um, uh, the Rai era. And here I'm thinking to myself, well, obviously it's different versions of him basically like how when he had a son Ninja still hate that freaking creature it's like it's the most god awful looking thing there is known to man basically I think when the Heisei version of um, the son of Godzilla came around that was a little bit more uh, realistic I think when uh, Godzilla vs um, like Destroyer came around that was a more uh, realistic looking version of Godzilla basically not this cartoonish like you know, we are universally good for all kids type look. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are some Godzilla films that were good for kids that were awesome. I mean, like, look at Gamera, basically. Gamera was great with kids, even if it had an awful lot of Kennys in it. Like, Kenny is basically a term we give kids that are rather annoying. <laughs> it didn't help that the dub actors just made the child sound so aggravating. Because I feel like the dub actors in those times just didn't care, and they were just doing the job for a paycheck, basically. It was the same thing with like Bruce Lee in Way of the Dragon. That really annoyed me because Bruce Lee could speak very good English. I mean, he was born in America, for goodness sakes, and don't at me at that. He was born in America. He may have Chinese parents, but he was born, I think, don't quote me, in Los Angeles. Either Los Angeles or San Francisco, because I think when he was a baby, there was a film he did where I, I remember the picture as well. There was the there was this husband and wife. They're holding the baby, and he's the baby on the Golden Gate Bridge. So I think, I think he was born in uh, San Francisco because his dad was a um, kabuki theatre actor, like the ones that have all the white face and the red marks on their face and all that stuff like that. So they were there to do um, uh, the dad's theatre production, basically, and that's where he was born. He was born in America, basically. So he uh, obviously had enough time when he was 18 at least, to go back and learn proper English, basically. So it kind of annoyed me when they did uh, the dub of him in the American release version. Like, I felt that like, that was really insulting, especially when they don't do that for, like, um, oh, what was his name? Chuck Norris. Yeah, Chuck Norris, because obviously he's American-born, so, like, why do you need to dub him? It's the same thing with Bruce. Why dub him? You know, because he can speak perfect English. I, I, I don't understand it. Like, you could even hear him, like, a few years before when he did um, that show uh, where he was talking about uh, the differences between uh, the Japanese and Chinese martial arts and his acting and all that stuff and how he doesn't like to be referred to as a superstar because he believes that being a superstar is kind of like you, you burn out after a time, basically. He'd like to be more known as an actor, you know, and a, 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 like, it don't even have to be a respected actor. Like, at least, you know know me for my craft basically and that's what he was he was an actor as of course he explained when he went back uh to china to do proper films because in, at least in china he was recognized whilst in america he was getting the raw end of the deal most of the time which is understandable really 
Oh, so, sorry, I'm talking about Bruce Lee when I should be talking about the book. I apologise for that. I get off topic really quickly. But yeah, that is mostly the synopsis of the book, basically. Um, Koro Minami are basically struggling with like trying to handle like the whole fame of the Hogan situation, whilst um, Koro's friend is basically trying to come to terms with the whole uh, Hogan might not step on me, so I'm gonna go on with life and all that crap. Yeah, it, the whole arc of that is kind of like forgettable at the end of the day, really. I don't mean to crap on the character. I mean she's a funny character when she wants to be. It's just when she's like simping for Hogan, it's kind of like uh. I'm kind of cringy now, stop that, you know, because it, <laughs> I mean, I understand, you know, you're a lover of kaijus, but, like, that takes it a little bit too far, really, like, when you're asking the freaking kaiju to, like, crush you and squish you and all that stuff, so it's like, come on now, uh, you might be a masochist, but I don't think you want to die that quickly, you don't want to die that fast, basically, it's not really necessary, so, um, yeah, that was the, um, fourth volume of, uh, Kaiju Girl Caramelize, and, um, yeah, I just want to talk about Bruce Lee and all of a sudden, really, because I feel like he got such a roaring good deal with an awful lot of his films, basically, because I love Way of the Dragon, but um, Enter the Dragon was kind of overrated, even though it was the film that kind of made him in the West, basically. But Way of the Dragon, or like, I just love the idea of here, him in a restaurant, just working there, and just randomly teaching the people at the restaurant, um how to defend themselves and he's defending the restaurant in turn basically and then it just ends with the amalgamation of the combat between him and Chuck Norris that fantastic fight but then there's also Fist of Fury which is fantastic because we kind of see more of a darker turn in Bruce Lee's acting where he kind of is in full revenge mode basically and we see that an awful lot in films where we have people that are always on quests for like revenge basically either they've killed a family member or kill a lover or something like that so you know you kind of have to go down those routes sometimes and it kind of ends very poignantly with uh, wait i'm not spoiling it but well i'm spoiling it but if you haven't seen it you know what are you doing with your life he basically takes a run up after screaming at the camera jump kicks and then you hear the gunshots as to like insignate that he's been shot and killed basically it's a fantastic film fist of fury and i think the i haven't seen the jet lee version but I hear from a lot of friends that have seen it, it's very, very, very good. Like, Jet Li is a fantastic martial artist. There are so many good martial artists in this day and age, basically, that I just don't have enough time to talk about all of them. I feel like Donnie Yen is my favourite um, modern-day martial artist. Well, that and Sammo Han, because I believe... Because Sammo Han uh, does an awful lot of the choreography for an awful lot of Donnie Yen's films and stuff like that. And I love Ip Man 2, where Sammo Han is um, a fellow master alongside Donnie Yen. And they're in that boxing uh, bout with that British boxer. I, re I really love the um, dramatic nature of Samo trying to like defend his honour and defend his martial arts um, heritage, basically. And his school from this foreign uh, power, basically, of Britain coming in and just lording over most of China at the time. I think this was during the Opium Wars, I believe, which was from 19... Don't quote me, 1950 to 1960 I'm not so sure I might have to go back on that but it's somewhere between the 40s and 50s basically just like after the second world war when uh, Japan uh, had to go back to Japan after their um, after their uh, control of China for a certain time because I think I think they took over Foshan because I think Foshan was where um, Ip Man resided, like he was a very wealthy um, martial arts master, and then Japan took over, and then it kind of um, turned his family's um, exploits into squalor, basically. So it was kind of an interesting story uh, to watch it from that point. But yeah, go watch Ip Man and Ip Man 2 and Ip Man 3 and all of them, because they're fantastic. Like, it tells the story of a brilliant Wing Chun master and his story, and I think even Ip Chung, uh, who is the uh, son, either son or grandson, I believe it's... Uh, uh, is that Ip Ching or Ip Chung? Because I think, I think Ip Ching is the son of Ip Man. Do not quote me. I really, really am bad. My memory is terrible. But yeah, definitely go watch them. They're fantastic. But anyway, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm talking about two different things at the same time. Sorry about that. But yeah, that was Kaiju Girl Caramelize Volume 4. I hope you all enjoyed. And um, yeah, 
maybe tonight or maybe tomorrow I will be doing another Elden Ring upload. I've got two more games coming up after Elden Ring. Do not worry, I'm not going to do them backwards and forwards. We're going to get through Elden Ring and then um, we'll do the next two. I feel like I might interchange the next two games out because um, there is one that is really interesting and I really want to put it on the channel. But um, yeah. So with that, lads and ladies, I thank you all ever so much for watching as always. And yeah, I love you all. Thank you all so much for just... Being patient with me and enjoy my content. Take care, everyone.